each one of you and my hope and prayer is that you'll have a really truly blessed day as men and, um, and that your wives and your children will spoil you rotten today if they haven't already. God bless you guys. Let's pray. This morning I want to talk to you about this question, what do you feed your family? And specifically geared to the fathers here and also a flow over to the women as well that are mothers. But what do you feed your family? And some of you are recent fathers and some of you are going to be future fathers. But the question remains with us is what do we feed our fathers? And there's a scripture in Luke chapter 11 verses 11 through 22. And the, the passage goes like this. You fathers, if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? Or if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? And the answer is, of course not. How many of us, if your kid were to walk up to you and say, Dad, would you give me a piece of bread? You would say, no, here's a rock. Some, that, yes, he would do that. No, here, chew on this a bit. You know, grind your teeth on a piece of a rock or something. Or give you a snake. But several years ago, there was a woman who was convicted of poisoning her family by mixing poison in her family's food. And many of us are guilty of poisoning our families because we've mixed poison in the food that we find and that we feed our families. But what is that particular poison that we feed? It might not be a physical poison where a person dies, but it has detrimental effects, and yet it might be to the point where a person may die a spiritual death. And ultimately, that's what we're concerned about. Jesus, like our Heavenly Father, recognized that good fathers would never give their children something bad. They would never give a scorpion. They would never give a stone. They wouldn't poison their kids. Obviously, a dad would always want to do the very best that they can for their children. And that's what we have the example of in Jesus and even the message that Jesus is teaching us. He assumed that no father would intentionally bring any grief or bring any hurt or bring any kind of um, problems into their children's lives. And yet there are parents who give their children serpents when they ask for a fish. Some would give a scorpion when they ask for an egg. And what do you, what, Steve, what are you talking about? What do you mean by that? You see, we read in Matthew's Gospel a very similar passage, and it says that you parents, if your children ask for a loaf of bread, will you give them a stone instead? Of course not. You want to nourish your children. You want to take care of your children. You want to bless your children. I know that that was the case in my dad. When he spoke to me and he, he pulled me aside and he said, I'm, I'm doing this for your own good. I didn't get it at that time. Looking back, we do get it. We do understand what God and, and what our fathers were trying to do. So often we allow our families to be fed the wrong things in this world, in, especially in our times that we live today. We sit back and we simply fold our hands oftentimes and we just let these other things come and feed our children rather than us stepping up. And if you want your family to have the right things, you cannot simply sit back and be passive about their spiritual well-being. So oftentimes when we have baby dedications, you as parents, you commit yourselves to, to the well-being of the spiritual aspect, the spiritual nurture of your children. Sometimes there's godparents, and they would do the same, that we are there to take care and guide our children. But the question that, again, I pose you this morning is, who is feeding your family? And you say, well, I'm obviously taking care of them. I mean, I'll go to work every day, I'll work hard, and, and I'm taking care of my family. But so oftentimes, it's that's just simply providing isn't enough. There needs to be a more than that. It needs to, you need to be the example as a father to your children. And say this, if your child looks at you and say, Daddy really loves Jesus. Daddy is in love with God. I wonder how many of us can truly say that, having had parents, or maybe are a parent, and you look at your children, or maybe some of the young people that are here, and that you would think about your dad for a moment. Could you really say that, my dad really loved God? And unfortunately, we can't all say that, because none of us, not all of us, have had those wonderful examples of godly parents. But you that are seated here this morning, you can change that if you're not that person right now. You can become a godly man. You can become a godly woman that your children look up to and really be the example to them. It is possible today that there are people feeding our children that are giving them poison. Interestingly enough, there are plenty of people that if we don't feed them spiritually, they'll fill that void and feed your kids 
the stuff that is poisonous to them. And none of us would actually want that for our children. And most times, these people don't even ask your permission as a parent. They don't come up to you and they would say to you, listen, can I feed John this? Can I feed Henry this? Can I feed Holly this? And we think, wow, they've never even asked, and yet we discover things are going bad. And so who is feeding our children? The first thing that we want to look at is that society, the world that you and I live in every single day, feeds our children. There are things, and they teach them concepts, they teach them values, they teach them ideas that are totally contrary to what the Word of God says. And we find it real difficult to navigate through this morass of immorality, this morass of, 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 of thought that is totally contrary to what Scripture and to what Jesus has said. Society teaches all who will listen. There's not one here that is not able to be taught by society. And if we give in to that, we will find ourselves being shipwrecked on the seas of the society that we live in. Tears society teaches, get what you can. By any means, do it and just simply get, get what you can. Get it wherever you can and get it in any way that you can. In other words, just step on people, destroy people. As long as you achieve what you want, it's all about you. And that's what society teaches our young people. And uh, we see that in, in so many young people's lives is that it's all about them. And the concern about others seems to be on the side. But I don't just see it in young people. I see it in adults. Because after all, what do they see in our lives? Do they see that same selfishness, that same do whatever you can, no matter how you can, just, just, just get whatever you want, however, however you want. And unfortunately, that's what drives society. It's so self-centered. It's, it's, it's not what we were singing about this morning. That I could know you, Jesus. And the second thing is to tell others about you, Jesus. This is the message that Christ tells us to. Society also teaches our families that all other values are more important than spiritual values. They would teach kids that go to college, and I've seen kids come back from college, and they come back and their whole mind has changed. Because they teach that religion is just a crutch. That it's only the weak that have religious belief. It's best just to believe in science and, and believe in evolution and believe in all these theories. That, that's exactly what many of them are. It's just simple theories. But we have a faith in, in, in a theory rather than the God of the universe. And we need to be aware of that. And we need to understand that how much society influences the thought patterns of people today. And maybe you yourself have been influenced through that. Maybe some of you that are seated here, you can think back when you were at college. And you can think back what your professors taught you. You see, society feeds the family on the idea that spiritual values add little or anything to a person's life. They, spiritual values are actually insignificant because you need to do whatever pleases you. It's all about you. And when your family asks for a bread, of truth from society, what do they get? They get the stone of selfishness. And that's what society teaches, that it's all about you. The world revolves around your little life. And that's contrary to what Scripture says. Scripture says our world needs to revolve around Jesus Christ. And then we need to be concerned about others, that they too will find and discover eternal life in Christ. Yesterday I was at a funeral, and it was I was saddened to, to hear some of the things and just the... You know, the, the person that, 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 that passed away was so involved in the things of, this, of the world, and they, they were noble things, they were wonderful things. But in the back of my mind, I was questioning, but I didn't hear anything about their relationship with Jesus Christ. And I sat there for this hour, and, 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 and my heart was grieved hearing this. I'm thinking, wow, there was no assurance of eternal life. There was no assurance that because they loved Jesus so desperately that he found himself in the presence of Jesus. There was none of that. And I walked out of there with, my, with a heavy heart and I thought, boy, oh boy, we are so fortunate as believers to have discovered and, and, and having Jesus Christ being revealed to our lives that one day when we do close our eyes, there is hope beyond this existence. And it is a wonderful, wonderful hope. You see, so, so the, the, the society that we live in also teaches that family itself is really not that important. You know, it's, it's, why is family important? It's because 
God established the family. And if we have strong families, we will have strong morality. We will have a change in our country. But the world has said, just get rid, get rid of children. The children really don't count. Let's abort the kids, because kids are sometimes an inconvenience, so society teaches. I read an article this past week, and I was so moved, and I think I may have even reposted it. Um, but this particular story goes that, and, and, and I, I think it may have been a picture. There was a picture, and the, and the question was, why is there so many, why is there cancer in the world? Why is there so much disease in the world? Why is there so much hardship in the world? Why is this, and, and they had all these questions they were asking God. And then the next question, God answers those questions. And he said, because you killed 60 million babies. And in amongst those 60 million were those that had the cure for cancer, that had the discoveries that would have changed the world. And I thought about that, and, and the Lord really spoke to my heart, and I said, there has to come a time of accounting in our lives. There has to come a time of accountability in our society, because society dictates this, and it's totally contrary. God values life. And I, I, I get so pleased when I see the post this morning on Facebook, how they love daddy, and these pictures of kids, and, and then posts of people thanking God for their parents. And that blesses me, because we value family we value dad we value mom and the family is so important so don't believe society when it says that family is not important then it, the society also teaches that it's okay to just live as you please just go ahead and just live a loose life and and do whatever pleases you here's that nike saying just do it just do what i would say just go and serve jesus christ just go and do it already. Fall in love with him. Society teaches about immorality and sex education and, and what's being thrown at our young people in the schools today, that everything's okay, it doesn't matter. Folks, as, as, as parents, you need to step up and say, this is what Scripture teaches. This is what the Bible teaches about morality. And dads, you have a responsibility to your children to teach them the things that the Bible teaches them about sexuality. And if anyone wants to fight this fight of licentiousness that's out there, there is a place to fight that. Be proactive about it. Post stuff about it. Be, 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 be vocal about it. Don't just sit back and say, well, America's going down the hill and, it's, and there's nothing we can do about it and we may as well enjoy the ride. You can't, you can't do that. As Christians, we need to stand out. We need to be different. And as men, we need to be the ones that, that, that your kids can look up to and say, that's not my dad. That's not how my family operates. More than 75% of all the movies that are showing any day of the week and in any city or country, 75% of these movies are not for general audiences. You think, why? And yet the movies that seem to do the best are the ones for general audiences. Those are the ones that seem to gross the most. Now children are being misinformed about God's purposes for sex by television, sitcoms, and soap operas, and movies, and even in school. As parents, we need to come alongside, and even if they're being taught that in school, say, this is not what the Bible says. This is not what we believe. Yes, that's what the world teaches, and that's what society may teach, but this is not what we believe as believers. Then there's another influence that we need to understand, and that is our friends. Because friends influence our children, influence our families. What kind of friends do we have? Are they friends that glorify God? Are they believers? And so oftentimes, you know, our, our daughter goes out with an unbeliever, or the son goes out with an unbeliever, and, and we think that our son or our daughter will bring that person into the fold and, and reveal Jesus to them. I've seen the exact opposite. When people start dating people outside of their faith, outside of a relationship with Jesus Christ, I'm not talking about Nazarene church or, or Baptist. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a relationship with Jesus Christ. The chances are that that one will pull away your child from their walk with Jesus Christ. I've seen it over and over and over again. Date fellow believers. Well, how do I find them? Pray. Ask Jesus about it. Parents, be vigilant about your children's well-being. 
what the small groups that we are involved in. They form their own circles of thought in their own value systems. And they become isolated. We can join all sorts of clubs and clubs that even don't believe in Jesus. And I've been surprised how many clubs are formed in our school systems that don't value the principles and don't have the same values as believers do. Folks, stand up and be there for your children. Come alongside of them. Encourage them to be, have a strong faith, to be there for them. We tend to adopt the values and the lifestyles to which we most often exposed. And if we are always exposed to garbage, it's like that old computer jargon, it's like garbage in, garbage out. And the more we put garbage in, the more we become polluted in our own lives. We need to be different as believers. And men, we need to be different. We need to be those men that of integrity, men who love Jesus first and foremost. We must always be aware that our families are being fed, but they're not always being fed the right stuff. Come alongside. I love that picture, you know, with in, in, in that little video clip. There was a, the, the girl, she was looking at her boyfriend on the, on the computer and they were chatting and stuff, and he comes alongside. That's what you need to do. I'm not saying just in, butt in all the time, but be cognizant and be aware of what your children are doing, what they're posting, what they're reading, what they're looking at. Be aware of those things as parents. It's your responsibility, it's our duty as parents. As guardians of those that God has entrusted to you, He trusts you with your children. They also need to be able to tell them about God. The other place that we need to be thinking about is school. And though some of you are educators that are here, and maybe you're going to be future educators, what are you going to be teaching your kids? Are you simply going to take what the... What, what the the, the district would say, this is what you must teach, or are you going to stand up and say, I can't teach this with a clear conscience because it goes contrary to what my biblical principles are. And sometimes it's costly in our lives, but God expects us to stand for truth in our lives, no matter what comes down the road. Too many families have sat back and they've let the school be the only source of authority and information that our children have. And some of you kids, you're probably saying, yeah, I, 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 I can relate to that. And some of you that are teachers that are here today, you can say, yeah, I, I understand that. But stand for truth, that, you, that your students would know there's something different about you. Not that you have to come down with a big Bible and hit them on the head. I'm not saying that. But be the example of morality. Be the example of a clean mouth. Be the example of, of a loving teacher that really cares for their students. Christian parents have a great responsibility to know exactly what the kids are learning and what they're involved in as far as their education is concerned. And not only does it stop, must, uh, uh, end there, be concerned and be aware of what your kids are doing extramural. In other words, outside of the school system. What are they doing in the afternoons? Who are they hanging out with on the football field? Who are they hanging out on the lacrosse field? Who are they hanging out playing baseball? What are they doing? Be aware of what's happening. Paul, in writing to the believers in Rome, he recognized the importance of what we feed our minds. He said this in Romans chapter 5. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So as parents, as men, what do we think about? As future parents and, and young people, what do you think about? Are you controlled by God the Holy Spirit? Is your mind focused on God? Is Jesus Christ the first and foremost thought in your lives? And then secondly, so letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. If God the Holy Spirit is controlling you and God's leading you and empowering you, it leads to life. If you push God outside of your life, it will lead to eternal destruction, eternal separation from God. And parents, you have such a responsibility to be the example, to teach your children, to be the example to them, that they would see Jesus in you, that they would see you as a signpost that points them heavenward and towards Jesus. With so many others feeding our families, how are we to go about feeding them on top of what all the stuff that society, what school and, and friends are teaching them? You are the parent. You're not a friend of your child. You, I, I'm so tired. Oh, I'm, 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 I'm Johnny's friend. No, you're Johnny's parent. Get rid of the friendship. Understand. Yes, you can be friendly to your children, but be a parent. Young people, your parents are your parents. They're not your buddies. 
And there's honor that the scriptures talk about. Children, honor your parents. Parents, honor your children. Parents, don't, men, don't provoke your children to anger. There's all these scriptures that we read in, in, in God's word, that, that how we ought to be and how we ought to do this thing called parenting and how we ought to take care of our parents. We cannot shut them off from the flow of the worldly ideas and anti-Christian concepts. The moment they leave your house in the morning, they're exposed to everything that the world is out there. What society teaches is normative. That's not normative. Being a follower of Jesus Christ is normal. Being a worldly person is not normal for a believer. We need to stand and be different. We can help our young people. We can help our children by evaluating their standards and feed them the truth from God's word. And take time and be concerned about the well-being of your children. If your children are going to see television programs that have pagan concepts of family within them, you need to sit them down and just come alongside them and say, so what do you think about this show? Is this scriptural? And have a dialogue about it. Don't just turn on the tube and say, honey, dear, go and, and, and that the TV becomes the babysitter. You be there as a parent. And don't, turn off the programs that are vile and disgusting. Don't even entertain them. As parents, we have a responsibility, especially you as fathers. It is a great idea to have that discussion about the shows, about the movies, and the trends that are currently the latest that seem to be out there. And say, how does this honor God? Or is it honoring to God? Be a believer and let your children, you, you are their guardian. And this way parents can bring a godly viewpoint, not necessarily ramming the Bible on top of them and saying, you've got to change, you, you enforce it. You can't do that. You need to just guide them and be there for your children. Keep your children and keep Jesus in the forefront of your minds. Christ first, and then as you're focusing on Jesus, tell your friends. Tell and be the example even to your circle of friends of what a believer is. Many Christian parents a generation ago felt that they had to force Christianity or, or isolate their kids from the world and, and put them in an igloo and say, you're not going out, you can't do anything, and, and, and it's quenched the spirit of so many children. And young people, perhaps some of us may even be a product of that. And we've, we've rebelled against that authority. But that's not the answer. Isolation is not the answer. Because Jesus said we're in the world, but we're not of it. In other words, we need to be out there with Christ at our side. The answer is to give young people the ability to evaluate and to judge themselves as they see things and they hear things. Give them the tools to evaluate those things in light of what Scripture teaches, in light of what Jesus requires of us. That's the important thing. And young people, whatever happens in your life and whatever the world would throw at you, whatever society would dictate to you, stand up against it and say, this is not right according to the Scriptures. And I'll tell you what, God will bless you for it. He'll come alongside you. He'll strengthen you. He'll make you the person that other kids come to. And they'll say, tell me about your relationship with Jesus. When I was in, co in, in, in college and in, 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 in high school, I didn't know about Jesus until one of my friends invited me to a youth group. That's how I was introduced to other believers. And I checked them out and I looked at them and I went for the wrong reason, but ultimately I was exposed to the gospel. And then I found Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I knew I was religious before then. I mean, I feared God, but it was through a young person, one of my friends that invited me. I remember his name clearly. I can see his face right now. He says, Steve, why don't you come to youth group? And I did. And it changed my life. But sometimes kids come to youth groups and there's no change that goes on. And so we ask and so we, we have to be so con and, and, and be about the, the education of our young people that it's focused all around Jesus Christ and the change that Christ can bring into our lives. Secondly, you as a person, must feed your family. Don't leave it up to someone else. We have a responsibility. Jesus assumed that fathers would feed their families. He also assumed that what you would feed them would be all the good things. That the standards that we've been talking about, about these godly standards, can be developed. First, we can give our families a Christian lifestyle. 
What does it mean to have a Christian home? Do our children see Jesus in our homes? The way that we conduct ourselves, the way that we talk to one another, the way that you speak to your spouse, the way that you speak to your children, the way that you speak to a friend on a phone. However it is, are we living the example of godliness in our homes? Family members learn far more by observation of one another than they do by instruction. However, instruction and observation are important. We can't just push those out. But we need to really understand what God is doing in our lives. The Christian homes of parents allow the rest of the world oftentimes to teach their children. It's time we stop that as believers, as Christians, that we stand and we say, not in my household. I love that portion from Joshua. As for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. Can we say that as believers this morning? As for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, families often are told and they, that, that they won't like what the church has to offer. You know, if, you, if you've ever been with, with, with some people and say, yeah, I can't stand my church. That's, I, I never go to church. It, it's, I just, you know, it's so out there. It's, uh, I, it does nothing for me. But what do we think about our church? What do you think about East Rockaway Nazarene? Do we invite people to come and hear the good news that Christ has for them? Do, I'm, I, I don't want to sound heavy on you this morning, but it's so important that we, that we take the responsibility as believers for our lives. The second item is that we give our, our, our children Christian values. The values, unfortunately, that the world says, uh, the, uh, materialism, it's all about you, get as much as you can, accumulate as much as you can. Are these the values that we hold as families? Or not? Or are we concerned more about others? If your families learn the spiritual values, these are that, are that, are that they are the most important. They learn that because they see you having those values. And those values will be then transferred to your children that they in turn will have the same values in their future families as well. It's so important. The basic value that Jesus talked about is that people do not live by bread alone. He said that. People do not live. What, what, what was Jesus saying there? He said it's not about the stuff. That's not how people live. We don't simply live by bread alone. And then he added, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. That's how we live. And so it's not about the stuff, but we live our lives according to what God's word reveals to us and what God teaches us. This is how we conduct our lives. This is how we live. There are organizations and activities in which family invests time and, 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 and effort, and yet they add nothing to the spiritual life of our young people. We spend this enormous amount of money on all sorts of resources, but yet it teaches our kids nothing about the values that we hold. Folks, it's time we examine our lives. What's important to our children? What's important to us as a family? What's important to me as a father? In all our organizations and activities, except the church, other values are more important. When you come to church and about Sunday school and the kids are there being taught and they come to vacation Bible school or they come to youth group, these are the values, these are the important things. These are the most important things that we must value as Christians. It's not the other stuff. It's not the drama. It's not the singing. It's none of those things. None of those things are more important than what you teach them about the values of their relationship with Jesus Christ. Folks, we need to understand that. And parents, you need to understand it. And men especially as the leader in the Christian home. Two young people were once got together and they were discussing religion one day. And one of them was talking about how, he, how outmoded his particular church was. And how his church never did anything for him or his family. And he was really running the church into the ground. And he continued to tell his friend, How little they actually participated in the life of the church because everything about the church just was bad. He had this real gloomy negative thought about the church. The other young person said there, and he was listening quietly, and then when his friend had finished, he said his experience of church was quite different to what his friend was. 
He enthusiastically described the youth activities and how much his parents thought of their church and how much he loved going to Sunday school. He spoke warmly of the friendships that he'd made at church and how he was grateful for the opportunities that were given to him to serve and to discover his talents and his godly um, future in light of the church. He, was, he loved his church. And as they continued to discuss the church, they quickly discovered to their amazement that they actually belonged to the same church. Whose fault? What was the difference in these young peoples? The difference was not in the church because it was the same church. So what, what was the difference? The difference was in their homes. See, what that other young person heard in their home was all the negative stuff and all the stuff because obviously their parents weren't living the life. But in the second home, God was number one. And the relationship was number one. And that, in turn, was the model that the second young person looked at. Folks, we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility. And if your child asks for bread, would you give him a stone? Of course not. And if your child asks for direction, point them to Jesus, first and foremost. And then pray with them. Come alongside with them. Encourage them. Read the scriptures together. Be there for your young people, for your children. Introduce them as a parent to the very bread of life that you have discovered for yourself. He needs to be the one. He needs to be the one that we come and share with one, of, with one another. Families who talk about Christ in the home and who talk with Him in the home can expect His presence in their home. There it is over there. If, you, if Jesus is spoken about in your home to your, to your children if Jesus is the center when you, when you get together around the table and you pray I remember every meal we used to hold hands and pray and it wasn't just for the meal but it was some other things that, that happened during the course of the day at my, at my parents home how we prayed and as a young people I thought oh, you're just like that girl oh dad you know this again but looking back, I value those things and, and that prayer together, devotional time together. Sharon, can, uh, Sharon and I were talking about this and she was saying how her dad always used to come and read the scriptures. He'd take out the Bible at the dinner table and read a passage and then pray and give thanks for the meal. Well, what an example. And, and I see Sharon, how the love that she has for Jesus from a very early life because she saw it in her family. Before her father was a believer... The kids didn't see that. And I see it in the, in the children's lives, her siblings, that, that, that grew up in a family that wasn't Christian, that didn't have Christian values. The difference in Sharon's life compared to the others. Her and her younger brother served the Lord. The other ones are sort of on the perimeter, on the fringe. Because Jesus needs to be number one in our families. He needs to be number one in our lives as men and as fathers. He should be made as familiar and as easy to talk about in our family as the next person that you know so well. He should be easy to talk about just as easy as you talk to your spouse. Just as easy as we talk to one another. You see, if Jesus is known and we have a relationship with him. He's not a stranger anymore. He's like part of the family. He, he's valued. We spend time with him. We talk with him. We, we pour out our lives before him. That embarrassment or awkwardness in talking about Jesus Christ, if we have that in our families, it's an admission that you and I then are not really in love with Jesus. So if our heart and our mind is so focused on Christ, there would never be embarrassment. There would never be any kind of timidity in talking about Christ because we're acquainted with Him. And by this, by talking about Him and having Him in the center of our lives will demonstrate that we are at home with Christ and Christ is at home with us, living in our homes. An atmosphere in which we feel at home with Jesus Christ is one of the richest heritage that you can pass on to your family, that you can pass on to your children. What are we passing on? How are we passing this on? It simply means that you and I must share with them meaningfully and genuinely 
our experience that we've had with Jesus Christ. Think about your dad for a moment, those of you that grew up in a Christian home. Do you know how your dad found the Lord? No? Then ask him. Find out about their Christian experience. Ask mom and dad, tell me how you became a Christian. No matter how old they are, no matter how old you may be this morning, discover your Christian heritage, your, your, your faith that you have as a common denominator being Jesus Christ. Fathers, Christ should mean enough to you that you want to share his friendship with your family. That's how important Jesus ought to be to you as, your, as a father. Don't just let your children go out and do their own thing. The truth is others are actually feeding your family. Understand that. There are others that are willing to step in where we, do, where we fail to step in. And if you're a believer this morning, you're a friend of Jesus, and introduce your best friend to your children and to your family. He is the bread of life, and he can be the bread of life to them as well. As you've experienced Jesus, give that same bread to them. Don't give them a stone the stone of society or anything else. Give them the very bread of life. Have you given them a stone? Of course not. And obviously you would never want that. And so the obvious question that Jesus had to that question, if your son asks you for bread, will you give him a stone? Will you? What's in your heart? What are you giving? Obviously, you wouldn't want to say, of course, I don't want to. No, I want to give them Jesus. And that's the right answer. Fathers, by knowing your heavenly father and knowing him well, you will in turn be able to introduce your children to the heavenly father as well. God is loving. He's approachable and he's generous. Are you the same? Are you approachable? Are you loving? Are you generous concerning the things of the kingdom? That's what Christ is calling us to. God can and will help you to become the example of a godly man to your children and to your spouse, to your wife, if you can, and you can feed your family well. And I'm not talking about the physical things here. I'm talking about their spiritual well-being as men. What are we giving? And I pray that each one of you men that are fathers today, you will step up to the plate and you'll say, Lord Jesus, I want to be that man that you are calling me to be. To be the example to my family. To be the guardian of my children. To be the example that I would love them with the love that you have shown me. That they would see Jesus in me. And that they would fall in love with you, Jesus. And it's not the other stuff that's more important. It's you, Jesus. And that is the most important thing. The most, the pinnacle of everything. And then to tell them to tell others about Jesus. I want to pray with you men. If you have